go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do <clears throat> we do thank you and we praise you, Lord, for this opportunity to look to your word. For Lord, something right down home, right where we are, right where we live. And I want to ask and pray, Lord, that this would have just an eternal impact on people's lives. We tend to forget, Lord, that it is all these temporary things that we are living through day by day, Lord, really, some of them really matter when it comes to eternity. Some of them don't, but some of them really do. And our subject for today, not just this morning, but tonight, surely does sow a lot of seeds right into eternity and also helps us practically throughout our everyday life. So we look to you this morning, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, as our Deliverer, and Lord, as the one who strengthens us to overcome the battles of our everyday life. And so I ask on behalf of those who will hear this message this morning, that Lord, you would make this very individual by the power of your Holy Spirit that people would individually know in their heart that, that, Lord, you are speaking to them about individual things that they need to do in their own life to maybe patch up a hole that they have in their holiness. We want to ask and pray this morning, Lord, that your grace would be seen here and that your grace would be seen through us as we walk out into the arena battle we fight every day called this world. And our adversary, Lord, he's seeking to destroy us. And he's seeking to destroy us through one another too. And so we want to pray and ask Lord Jesus that we would see this morning. This truth is a beautiful thing which can change our lives, lives and change the way we walk forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as you know, We've been having a series here called The Sermons That You Asked For. You guys gave me about 40 different questions, summarized in about eight or nine different topics. And uh, some of them you can answer with one sermon, others they take a couple. This is one of them. Uh, to go through all this in detail today would be, <laughs> would be really, really difficult, and I feel like it would do it in service. Uh, to the topic as a whole. So if you don't, if you don't feel like this morning really got to the root of your issues, maybe um, come back tonight because tonight we'll be taking this to a to a, a deeper, deeper level. Uh, I won't say a deeper level. We'll just look at it in a different perspective. <clears throat> okay. So somebody just simply asked me, how do I overcome pain? How do I overcome pain in my life? Made me think of it. Think of it like this. Did you know that in ministry, in ministry, which is my, the life in which I live, but it's positive, but in ministry, your biggest problem is not going to be sermon preparations, and your biggest problem is not going to be time management. Your biggest problem is not going to be You know, or just finding time to do things. Your biggest problem is most likely going to be people. Am I allowed to say that? Ought to be because it's true. Y'all killed me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're forgetting prayer. Okay. No, seriously. Seriously, your biggest problem is going to be people. Not just in ministry, but in life in general. Your biggest problem is going to be people. Always. Personality differences. Emotional people. People can be very critical. People can be overbearing. People can be judgmental. People are apt to error. Did you know that? People can mess up sometimes. Sometimes we can misjudge their mistakes and think it the wrong way. Um, people are liable to outbursts, and the list goes on. And although I do believe in Christian perfection, I do not believe in sinless perfection. I don't believe that people could ever be flawless. But I believe that people can be blameless. I don't, people, I don't believe that people could ever be flawless. I think we all have personality flaws and defects. 
that the Lord may or may not deal with until we get to heaven. It doesn't keep you from heaven. But there's just certain personalities that I have a hard time with, and there's certain personalities you all have a hard time with. Let's just be honest about that. <clears throat> but the problem with all of that is if we don't look at it in the light of grace, we walk around with a bunch of pain in our life that is almost unreconcilable sometimes. And so what we have to do is we have to look above the everyday problems that we might face. And we might, and we're going to look at this morning, how do I overcome pain in my life? How do I overcome pain? Of course, you know by now I'm not talking about bumping your knee or stubbing your toe or hitting your funny bone. I'm talking about deep-rooted emotional pain. How do I overcome that? And some of this pain is deeper, is, uh, some of your all's pain is deeper than others. I understand that. But we all overcome it the same way. Emotional pain is detrimental to your life. Did you know that? Emotional pain is detrimental to your life. To your life. If you carry that, and we pray, and we know, everybody in here knows somebody who has cancer right now. But did you know that, that cancer can be caused by bitterness and, and anger and things in your life that actually shuts down your immune system in some ways? This not only hurts you emotionally, it hurts you physically. You know, pain has to be dealt with. It has to be taken care of. And emotional pain is detrimental to your life and Jesus wants you to be free from that. He really does. He doesn't want you to hold on to things that are unnecessary. He wants you to be free from it. So you have to ask yourself, okay, and this is a polarizing question. You think this would have a simple answer, but it doesn't for most people. How do I overcome pain? How do I overcome this anger? How do I overcome this bitterness? How do I overcome this unnecessary stress and anxiety that is on my life that has been caused by people hurting me? How do I overcome this? So in response to God's grace, and I think that's the most important thing you have to recognize this morning, God's grace goes beyond forgiveness, but God's grace also gives you the power and the ability to overcome things in your life. But we have to respond to God's grace. You have to make a response to it. You have to say, okay, God's grace has abundantly come upon my life. So how do I respond to God's grace to overcome the things that I know He wants me to deal with and live in this victory that we sing about all the time that I cannot seem to obtain? So in response to God's grace, I believe the Holy Spirit gives us three choices, three choices, choices we have to make to overcome pain in our life. First choice this morning, is to choose your thoughts. Did you know that you can choose your thoughts? You don't have to think the way that, that you do most of the time. A lot of people have never realized this. They never realize it. And Satan would love to keep you from ever discovering this truth. That you do not have to think a certain way. You don't have to think that way. You can actually choose your thoughts. I was laying in, in right before I went to down, or right before I lay down and go to bed. I was talking to Tab just, just last week, <clears throat> and I said, it, all of a sudden, I mean all of a sudden, within a, about the course of five minutes, from the time I walked out of the home to the time I got laid out in my bed, just as got out of prayer, I became enormously depressed over all the loved ones that I lost over the last three or four years, which was a lot. I lost my aunt, my grandmother, and my father to the car accident. Three years, my mom moved off, my sister moved off, all of a sudden I'm the only one of my immediate family left in this county. And that just overwhelmed me all of a sudden. Right before I was about to go to bed. And I had a test the next day. And all kinds of other, and I was sitting here and I had all these thoughts going on in my head. And I just said out loud, I said, I am thankful that I can choose my thoughts. And I can and I can choose that God is good. I can choose that God is a good. And as, almost as soon as the thoughts came, they were gone. And I moved right on the line. And those thoughts haven't hurt me like they seem. Not because I'm spiritually strong, but because I know what God has done. I understand that. I understand that I have to choose my thought processes. <clears throat> By the way, I have to do this every day of my life. 
Every day of my life, people have a tendency to get under my skin or something like that, and I choose not to respond to that. I just choose to switch that off and move on. You can do this. James wrote to the early church right after the dispersion, and I've probably said this ten times in the last year, but I feel like people really need to get this. The, the, <clears throat> right in the first five verses in the book of James, which was written to Jews who had been driven out of their homeland, in the first five verses, one of those verses says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. James, the brother of Jesus, understood that. He said, listen, if you want to overcome this battle in your life, you're just going to have to choose to count it all joy. You're just going to have to make the decision. I mean, this is not a joyful thing. I mean, you're, you're, you've lost homes that's been in your families for hundreds of years. You've lost sheep farms that's been in your families for hundreds of years. And, you know, the, your own people have driven you out of your country. Your cousins hate you. Your brothers and sisters hate you. But you're going to have to count it all joy if you're going to overcome it. You're just going to have to say, you know what, God? I'm going to learn something through this. I am not going to let this get me down. This life is temporary. How can I count it all joy? God will be faithful to show you that. Outward pain is only for a season. But your reaction to outward pain can last for a lifetime. If you don't make a decision early on to, to react to that outward pain, the harder and harder it gets to overcome it. But I believe God can help you overcome that pain in just a second if it is by the grace of God. <clears throat> Further, Paul encouraged his people to rejoice always. Rejoice always. Rejoice is the verb form of joy. Rejoicing means that you can not only choose your thought, but irrespective of, of your feelings, what you're feeling at the time, you can rejoice always. You can rejoice always. Negativity drives me crazy. It does. Guess what? I'm not the only one. Negativity drives everybody around you crazy. When you're being negative, you're draining the energy out of people around you. Christians ought to be energy givers. You ought to be able to walk into a situation and say, you know what? The Lord is still good. You ought to be able to walk into the funeral home and, be, and your goal is to put a smile on somebody's face. You ought to be able to walk into a certain situation and, and allow God to move through you because you have hope to rejoice in. You understand that this life is temporary. You understand that trials are but for a season. Even the darkest of times are but for a season. Not always give way to it all somewhere. And you ought to live that hope, even though you don't feel like it. I can't emphasize that enough. Even though it doesn't feel that way, still choose to rejoice in these situations. Jesus said even, Luke 6, 22 and 23, Somebody, somebody asked in here, uh, one of these questions that were asked to me uh, was, why do, why do I try to be good to people when people tend to take advantage of me and people tend to hurt me and things like that? And that is so much a part of life. It's sad that this has to be a part of life. But it is a part of life. It hurts me too when people do that. Uh, if you want to be taken advantage of, get into ministry. That's just happens all the time, <laughs> you know? But that's okay. That's okay. Jesus said 6, 22 and 23 of Luke, Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. You know, when he started that sentence, he said, Blessed are you. You are blessed when that happens. Don't forget that. Don't ever forget that. God looks upon your struggles and trials, and when He sees you responding to it, and gives you grace to respond to it in a way that like, blows people's minds. Sometimes he's saying, man, you're blessed. You're blessed. You are identifying with me. He said, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For indeed, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner, like manner the fathers did also to the prophets. In other words, what Jesus was saying there is all of those people in the Old Testament that never did big things for God, they're all hated by the general populace. They're all hated. Because we spoke the truth in love. People couldn't do anything with them but hate them. Because they knew they couldn't argue with them. They knew they were telling the truth. 
And so people choose to hate. That's really, really, really prevalent in our culture right now. If you disagree with somebody, that means you hate them. I don't know if anybody else has noticed that. I don't hate anybody. I mean, I'm, I spoke to two people that are in two totally opposite sides of the, the thinking spectrum to me this week. One of them for three or four hours on the phone. And he actually had a real revelation from the Lord that he had some major problems in his life that needed to be fixed. And I'll tell you what, he hates everything I stand for. <laughs> he hates everything I stand for. <clears throat> but those people, we don't have to hate people because we disagree with them. Hurt is a part of life, but we, uh, but we would be shallow without pain in our life. Really, pain causes us to draw near to God so much closer. That if our life was easy, if our life was easy all the time, we wouldn't be nearly as close to the Lord as we are today. So, if you're going to count it all joy, you're going to rejoice always, and you feel like that that is impossible. By grace, you can attain this this morning. You don't hear anything else in this sermon. You can attain this this morning. You can attain the mind of Christ. That is a gift of grace. The mind of Christ is a gift of grace. Philippians chapter 2, verses, verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on in verse 8 to say, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. We can choose to humble ourselves. We can choose to to have the mind of Christ. We can say, God, I want this mind that allows me to rejoice and realize that life is not so much about me feeling good as much as it's about me glorifying you even when situations are not in my favor. <clears throat> God will always give grace to those who are willing to humble themselves and ask for these sorts of things. But bear in mind, no pun intended, but bear in mind, <clears throat> the mind of Christ will not dwell on hurt from up here, but the mind of Christ will dwell on help from above. The mind of Christ will not dwell on vengeance. The mind of Christ will dwell on forgiveness. The mind of Christ will not seek to avoid an issue. The mind of Christ will seek grace to redeem an issue. The mind of Christ is never oppression and anger. The mind of Christ is described as life and peace. Life and peace. And that's my goal for you this morning. That you walk out of here knowing with a, with a plan to have life and peace where you maybe have never had it before. <clears throat> One of the greatest contributors to Christianity apart from Jesus Christ is an argument the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament. He was in prison and beaten dragged through the mud, but his deeply theological, deeply educated mind gives us basically everything that we believe or can understand about Christianity today. Paul's epistles are commentary on the Gospels. I mean, he, I mean, he was so deep. But, you know, one of the things that always struck me about the Apostle Paul, I've heard this preached about in several different ways, and I think we touched on it last week. But, was... After Paul and the person who was discipling him, his name was Barnabas, after they had come off their first missionary journey, planted churches all over Asia, they had at one point there in that missionary journey had got put in prison for what for their belief, what they were doing. And they were put in prison in this little this little place in Asia called Paphos. And then after they were put in prison. They had another guy with them named John Mark. You may know him from his gospel. gospel. John Mark was with him. And what John Mark did after that just obviously astounded Paul to no end. He ran off and went back to his home. And back to the church, I believe, it says doesn't really matter as far as the story goes. Because Paul and Barnabas eventually um, caught back up with young John Mark and Barnabas' name means son of encouragement. He was one of those guys like, oh, let's give people a second chance to encourage people all the time. 
And Paul was not very encouraging sometimes. As you can read in his writings, he was very blunt, very black and white kind of guy. <clears throat> and in, in Acts chapter 15, it literally says the, the, the fight that him and Barnabas got into over John Mark literally split them. Barnabas and John Mark went down to Cyprus, and then Paul went and did the second missionary journey after that with another group. And we oftentimes focus on Paul and Barnabas through that. But could you imagine what young John Mark would have felt like? Could you imagine that? He was stuck in between these two great men of God and his disobedience his cowardice caused them to split. I couldn't imagine the, the mental fortitude and the grace that he would have had to have to go down to Cyprus and continue with the work after that. He was the cause of one of the most famous church splits in the Bible. Directly, the argument was over here. And sometimes we get caught in the middle of those things. And we would have to choose our thoughts We'd have to choose our thoughts. Remember, when negativity spills out of our mouth, we never know what kind of harm it can cause somebody else. Even indirectly. Even indirectly. Especially in a culture like Eastern Kentucky where just about everybody's related to everybody. Just say that. <laughs> if the first choice is that you have to choose your thoughts in the midst of your pain, then the second choice need to make is you need to pray. That seems like a, yeah, like a duh kind of thing. But you need to. We need to be reminded to do that. Because the devil loves, when he gets us upset, he loves to keep us out of the prayer closet. That's the first place you should run to. If you don't feel like praying, you better go pray. <laughs> That's the best time. you got to choose to pray, in other words. Prayer may not be what you feel like doing, but choose to do it anyway. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. <clears throat> and it will be given to him. We don't know it all, but God does. Isn't that good? Right. We don't know it all, but God does. And God can help us. Matter of fact, John Wesley even understood this. And man, I don't think in a lifetime any five of us will probably know more intellectually than John Wesley my goodness, the guy knew everything about everything it seemed like. If you ever read through his works, he was like, he covered it all pretty much. From logic to five different foreign languages to, I mean, he just, it's impressive, really. But he said this about prayer. God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. God does, think about the implications of that. God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. As much knowledge as he had, and he understood sciences, he understood, he even had, I think in his works, a, a thing about herbal medicine. I mean, he, but he understood the source of all that wisdom is God himself. God himself. When you don't know how to do something, or if you think you know how to do something, go to God. See if it's right. See if it's right, or if you don't know what it is, just go to him for wisdom. And when you go to God and pray, pray in whatever situation you're in to be an example of Christ-likeness within that situation. Pray to be an example. God, how would you respond to this pain that I'm going through right now? How would you deal with this? How would you, living through me, because that's exactly what Jesus wants to do, is He wants you to imitate Him through His power. How would you respond to this? Now we know that Jesus' ministry was just peppered with powerful confrontations with very potent parables that convicted people whenever they listened to them and things. But I'll tell you, one of the things we tend to miss is Jesus' prayer ministry. He was always praying. Read the Gospel of Luke and notice how many times Jesus got away from everybody to pray. He was always praying. So much so his disciples even asked him, Jesus, teach us how to pray. They never asked him to teach us how to preach or 
teach us how to perform miracles or teach us how, but they did say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. They understood that prayer was central to everything Jesus did. And I think one of the most amazing things that Jesus said in relation to people hurting him was when he was hanging on the cross, he looked down at his persecutors and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus is fully God. I also believe wholeheartedly that Jesus is fully human. He is both of those things. And He became that so that He could understand our shortcomings and understand our infirmities and understand how hard it is to forgive somebody that hurts you. We have to understand that about Jesus. That's why He did what He did and became flesh. He made Himself vulnerable. He made Himself weak. He put himself into the place where he could be tempted and even could have sinned, but he never chose to. He remained sinless, despite enduring what we endure in the flesh. It's an amazing thing that God himself put himself in that kind of place. But could you respond if you were hanging upon a cross and look down upon your persecutors and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Stephen said that. He was being killed. So we know another human being in history has done that. There are several missionaries and martyrs that have responded in that way. And I don't know that we could really know if we would respond that way until we were in the situation itself, to be fair. But I do know this about Jesus. He knew when he was going to face that cross, he knew that it was coming. He knew that it was going to happen. He spent his night before in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew that. This is what I have to do in order to complete the task the Father has put upon me. I'm going to have to pray tonight. I'm going to have to pray. He outprayed everybody around him. Everybody else is falling asleep. Jesus was praying. He was praying. And as Christians, we ought to be living that way. We ought to be living that way. We ought to have our heart prepared so that we can be an example of Christ's likeness in this in this time in which we live. And then pray also. Don't just go to God for your requests. I'm not saying don't do that. But don't let that be the whole goal of your prayer. Pray that God will put in your heart that He is your only desire. He is your only desire. By only, I mean He is your greatest desire. That above all things, if you have Jesus Christ, you've got it all. Pray that your heart is like that. Pray that your heart reaches that place of it has been. Because that, my friends, is the secret. That is the spiritual secret of deep Christianity. Is that if God took everything, you have lost nothing. Because all your sufficiency is found in God Himself. And that's a very God-like thing to have in your life because God is sufficient in Himself. And so we should find our sufficiency in God Himself. You all with me on this? Thomas the Kempis said, If God were our one and only desire, we would not be so easily upset when our opinions do not find outside acceptance. I'll read that one more time. If God were our one and only desire, we would not be so easily upset when our opinions do not find outside acceptance. <clears throat> True. True. Pray that we remain singular minded through the storms of life. We can identify with the hymn writer as we sing. The things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. <clears throat> the strongest among us will never overcome pain in our life in our own strength. Go to God. Pray. And open up that avenue in your heart to let prayer be not just something that you do because you're supposed to do it, let prayer be something that 
feeds your life. It feeds your life. It makes you more like Jesus each time you go through it. <clears throat> our first choice was our thoughts. The second was prayer. The third choice we need to make to overcome pain in our life is reconciliation. Reconciliation. If there is an era in which I could live or just experience a few things, anybody ever had this thought, like if I could go back in time, I'd like to see what this would have been like. Just during this time. This may sound strange, but I'd like to hear, and I'd like to live in the United States of America whenever Germany invaded Poland. I have no idea where Poland is. Good. You love German stuff and Nazi stuff? Yeah, well, George might know what I'm talking about. Whenever Germany invaded Poland, the world went all over. You thought 9 11 was bad. Whenever Germany invaded Poland, people were shaking in their seats. They were saying, What is going on? <clears throat> now, I'll tell you why they felt that way. And this relates perfectly to the sermon. I was thinking about how to illustrate this last point of reconciliation. And the thought that has been on my mind all week long, all week long, especially the last three or four days was the Versailles Peace Treaty. We have a Versailles, Kentucky, but we call it Versailles. <laughs> That's how you spell Versailles. Versailles Peace Treaty. See, <clears throat> Germany didn't cause one world war, they caused two. And whenever they caused World War I, they made a mess of Europe. And I mean they made a mess. They took tanks and just went right across here, and I mean destroyed most of Europe all the way to France. I mean, it was a muddle by the time they were finished. And so, <clears throat> whenever the Allies got involved in one World War II and World War I, they had to draw up a peace treaty. And the peace treaty they drew up was called the Versailles Peace Treaty. The Versailles Peace Treaty. And when they drew up that peace treaty, and the, they, they made it so hard on the Germans that the United States wouldn't even sign it. You know why? Because they said, if this peace treaty gets actualized in the end of their culture, they're never going to recover. They're going to be so bitter that this is going to cause a second world war. Somebody had the foresight to say that for the United States of America. And so Germany, when that peace treaty got signed, went from being the second most economically booming country in the world to the greatest depression the world has ever seen overnight. It was terrible. Overnight. Even though they caused so much destruction and harm. They had. They've taken millions of lives. And you can't discount that. But literally, the Versailles Peace Treaty was made out of pure bitterness and said we are just going to destroy the foundation of this country. They will never come back. And that's exactly what it did. Before you knew it, in order for a man to feed his family, the German dollar went so low it took a wheelbarrow of money to buy one loaf of bread over. And it was intentional. The United States of America said, don't do this. It's going to cause them to start another war. These people are already mad. They're already obviously violent and capable. Another thing they did was they took away all of their coal fields that bordered France so they couldn't have any sort of and that was a lot of their money right there, gone. They had no chance to do anything to bounce back at all. And war cost money. And they were broke too. Everybody was sorry that it happened. Peace was trying to take place. But the rest of Europe said, no. We're going to make you pay. We're going to make you suffer for what you know. And so it made them very angry. It made them very violent. It made them very hopeless. And it caused the climate in which somebody like Adolf Hitler could stand up and say, you know what? The rest of the world deserves another war. The rest of the world has brought Germany to its knees. And Germany is better than this. And a whole country got behind him and said, yes, we are. They were willing to overlook some of his more evil plans and strategies for the sake of being able to put food on their table. And then he did. And the whole world was shocked. German, they 
which was strictly against the Versailles Peace Treaty. They were not allowed to do any sort of imperial thing like that. Keep in mind, this was called the Peace Treaty. It was a peace treaty. But it makes you wonder how many of us, how many of us and how much of our culture does the same thing today? Instead of seeking to reconcile, we seek to hurt. You know one of the worst things that can hurt somebody is just that you ignore them. But tend to, we tend to try to overcome our differences that way. We think that is sufficient. We think that is sufficient. We think that, hey, you know what? This person has caused me problems, so I'm just going to write them off and not talk to them anymore. But does that really cause peace? Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. He was talking about people that make peace between God and man. But Jesus was the greatest peacemaker this world has ever seen. To a whole bunch of people that didn't deserve Him to do what He did. And as Christian people, we are to emulate that. Even when people have hurt us, our answer is not to ignore them. Our answer is to reconcile them. To them. Reconcile them. That today. That's why this is kind of building. You have to choose your thoughts. You have to choose to pray because you've got to be strong for this one in the Lord. Then you have to choose to reconcile with your brother and sister. And as a Christian, you are going to be the one to make the first step. You're going to be the one to make the first step. This is the whole that is in a lot of people's holiness today is that we are spiritual, we are close to God, we are praying, we are reading our Bible, we are living right, and all of those things are great and God is pleased. But you're never going to be deeply satisfied with your Christian faith until you have made reconciliation with the people that have hurt you. Sometimes we as Christians, in order to pursue peace, we have to find out what we can apologize for and apologize for. It. I'll tell you, it's a humbling experience. I've done it several times. You always walk away from that, though, with the fire of God on you. You always do. You always walk away from that being so close to God. In that because you're doing exactly what Jesus did. Yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He chose, to, he chose to forgive all people who had ever wronged Him, whether or not they ever accept His forgiveness of Him. That's Jesus. I'm glad somebody asked this question. Because honestly, it's hard to preach about it without your permission. It is. And with your permission, I'd like to go further. Just, just explain a little bit about what the Bible says in a couple of verses. We're called to pursue peace. Pursue peace. The two greatest commands love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And neighbor means all people. The two greatest commands are also summarized in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. It says, Pursue peace with all people. And holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's a very, very 
very scary scripture. Pursuing peace with all people and holiness, those two things. Without those two things, you're not going to see God. That's what the scripture is saying here. It is that important. Because God realizes that His, His, His atoning death on the cross is to put you back together the way He originally designed you. And while you have unreconciled things in your life, you're never going to be completely whole as a person. You're never going to be completely whole. You're always going to have a root of bitterness. You're always going to have uh, this tense thing inside of you that is pulling at you. And it limits, it limits who you can be in Christ. <clears throat> we must be careful to choose reconciliation, not confrontation. Not confrontation. You can't walk up to somebody and say, you know, look, you did this, this, and this to me, and I forgive you. That don't work. Don't do that. That's a confrontation. Reconciliation says, listen, we've had our differences in the past, and you don't bring up anything they ever did. So we've had our differences in the past, and I would like to apologize to the way I react. And I am sorry. I could have done better. I could have done better. And now that I know Jesus, He is helping me to do better. You better believe nine times out of ten that's going to affect somebody. Whether you see it immediately or not, that's going to touch them. They're going to say, this Christianity is real. Gee, personally. You know, I, I saw Trevor today. I never thought I'd ever hear those words out of his mouth. He apologized for something I did. Oh, I'm hurt. That's, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. <clears throat> Reconciliation says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. You ought to be able to walk away from that situation like Jesus is saying here and say, I'm leaving peace with you. You've left that person at peace on the things that you have done. And they might, may not ever apologize to you. That needs to be okay. That needs to be okay. You have pleased the Lord. And that's what matters most. Right? You have pleased the Lord, and that's what matters most. <clears throat> Reminds you about the Bible. Norman Gosler said, The Bible uses some of its character suffering to show the greater good, whether it be the massive spiritual growth of Job, the infirmities of the Apostle Paul, the captivity of Joseph, and the suffering of Jesus. They could all be summarized by, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God meant it for good. When you choose to buy God's grace to go and reconcile things. Let me tell you something. I've done this enough to know it never is easy. Especially the moments leading right up to when you talk to the person. Your whole body will want to turn you away from it. But you just put your foot down and do it anyway. You cry if you have to. I have. And you walk away from that feeling like you've got saved all over again. So I'll tell you. I'll just tell you. And it's just like, wow, it's a trap. <clears throat> Moreover, Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Can you imagine, just for a moment, can you imagine one of the enemies in your life getting saved, becoming a part of this church, sitting beside you and worshiping next to you? Worshiping next to you in a church service. You go back to World War II, that happened all over Germany. All over Germany. It's like Corey Ken Moon. We talked about that a few weeks ago, how she confronted that Nazi in the same church service with her. The same Nazi that oversaw the concentration camp that her sister died. And they loved each other. Isn't that? There's nothing more like Jesus. That right there. That right there. Because none of us deserve his presence. But he gives it to us anyway. The Holy Spirit, when it comes to this, he's not idle. He acts right now. He may be already laying upon your heart. This is what you need to do. You need to do this after church. You need to do this. You need to do this as soon as possible. Make reconciliation. Don't resist the grace of God. There is freedom. Maybe in this afternoon, you may not find it in this church service. You may go and reconcile something this afternoon that will bring you unrelinquished freedom like you've never known before. Don't miss that. Don't
don't miss the opportunity. If the Holy Spirit's telling you to do something, whether it's reconciliation or anything else, just go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. He's not in eye. Ephesians chapter 4, 26, 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. See, God's telling you, your anger may be justified, but just don't sin because of it. Don't sin because of it. Do not let the sun go down your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Reconcile something quickly before you do. Maybe you're already living with regret right now. Well, don't, don't pile up the regrets. Do something before you regret it further. Revisiting Hebrews chapter 12 before we close here, it says, Pursue peace with all people, and holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. That's strong wording. Falling short of the grace of God is falling short of salvation itself. Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up within you cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. In other words, what the Bible is teaching here is three things. Reconcile something quickly, or you're going to fall short of the grace of God. If you don't do that, you're going to become bitter. And when you become bitter, you're not going to take out your anger and bitterness upon the person that hurts you. You're going to take out your bitterness on everybody around you. And a lot of people have lived that way so long they've become numb to it. And maybe by the grace of God, He's exposing that this morning. He's saying, come to this altar. Get this fixed. You can have freedom. You can have freedom from that. Your heart can be tender again. You can love people again. You can do it. Get Mark. Get Mark and bring him with you. For he is useful to me for ministry. The Apostle Paul, in his final year of life, wrote a letter to Timothy, his young protege. And somewhere along the way, this is the last time you see John Mark's name appear in Scripture. Somewhere along the way, he had taken John Mark probably aside and said, I am sorry for what I have done. I doubted you. Maybe at that time it was justifiable doubt. Either. But somehow they reconciled their differences. And not only did he want to talk to John Mark and see John Mark, but what did it say there? That he was useful to him. He was useful. Now, if we don't feel like that we can perfectly model Jesus Christ, we can model the Apostle Paul. He was a human just like us. Fully, complete, without any divine intervention outside of the Holy Spirit. What we, what we have now. This is the last time John Mark was mentioned in Scripture. Just because there has been a wrong in the past does not mean there cannot be a reconciliation. Don't let the past define you. Don't let the past define you. We live in a heavenly hope. We live in a heavenly hope. People say this quote all the time. I may mess it up. They say this quote all the time. <clears throat> you know, we're, we're going to be side by side with people we never thought would be in heaven. You know, when we get there. But you know, if we leave this world bitter with anybody, I don't know that we'll be going to heaven with them. We better have things reconciled right now. And this is really a heaven or hell issue. I'm not trying to, to, to play on your emotions. I mean, I don't really, I'm telling you, this is what the Bible says. Falling short of the grace of God. Falling short of the very grace that saves you. You can't take that too lightly. Or you can't take that too seriously. <clears throat> I'd like to just close, close with this quote, uh, quote and open the altar for prayer. <clears throat> Richard Shelley Taylor said, Our tempers, anxieties, self-doubt, moral defeats, mixed-up emotions, crazy desires, interpersonal stresses, and all inner conflicts which tear us apart have their source not so much in childhood traumas or faulty environments as they do in our relationship. 
If that is put right at both the level of justification and sanctification, all other disorders are either solvable or manageable. Solvable or manageable. That's a powerful quote. It tells me that this man has experienced something that a lot of the church needs to experience. Not that we're ever going to have it so put together we're never going to get angry. It's not that we're ever going to have it so put together that some of our childhood traumas aren't going to haunt us from time to time. But that, you can manage that and it does not have to steal your victory. Or God can choose right now to solve that in this world. Once and for all. Sometimes we carry a thorn in the flesh so we can make God hear God more often. So what does God want to do in your life this morning? I believe He wants to make all of you reconcilers in some way. In response to grace, though you must choose your thoughts, choose to pray, and choose to reconcile your differences between these people. Because without the first two, there's no goal there except for your personal peace and satisfaction. God wants to give you that, but I will tell you this, and I'll be short changing you this morning if I didn't tell you this. You're not going to have that personal peace and satisfaction until you take the first two and use them as a means to react to the third. Say, you know what? I've carried this far too long. It is time for reconciliation. Amen. I hope that you're encouraged this morning. We're going to sing 535, Make Me a Servant. <clears throat> you will be served.